<laughs> All right, so let's get started. Um, welcome everyone. I am so excited to that everyone's here and to welcome you to our first Bookmarks event of the year. Bookmarks, as you may or may not know, is a event that we run uh, pro approximately four times over the course of the year, um, which celebrates um, and provides an opportunity for discussion for books that people in the English department have published. So I'm very excited. Today we're going to be talking with um, Dr. Dora Ahmad about her book, The Penguin Book of Migration Literature. Um, but I'm incredibly delighted to be able to introduce our interviewers and moderators. Oh, and before I do that, I just want to say that our other event is coming up in November. It's Professor Gabe Brownstein will be interviewed by Professor Bacote on his new book that's coming out, which is The Open Heart Club. And that's November 14th, so please mark your calendars. Um, so Sonia Adams is a PhD candidate, educator, and poet. She was born and raised in New York City. She's currently developing her dissertation prospectus on the study of feminist literature from the black diaspora. Her areas of scholarly interest include contemporary global literature, US multicultural literature, English studies, curriculum development, black diasporic studies, and multicultural feminist studies. And Leila Shikaki is a PhD, st PhD student, adjunct professor, and poet from Palestine. She's in her fourth year in the English department, PhD program, where she's working on producing her prospectus this semester. Um, Layla's poems have been featured in many, many literary magazines, including Tab, the Journal of Poetry and Poetics, Sequoia, Pomona Valley Review, Pomona Valley Review and We Chose Everything, um, a bilingual poetry anthology that features over 50 Arab poets published in Lebanon. Her research interests include Palestinian literature, Arab autobiography, immigrant literature, memoir writing, and world literature. She is passionate about Palestine politics and also wanted to give a big shout out to her two nieces, uh, who are presumably far away, <laughs> Samia and Salma. So anyway, join me in welcoming um, Sonia and Leila, um, who will then be interviewing and moderating our conversation with Dr. Ahmad. Thank you. Dr. Travis for this introduction. Um, Sonia and I are very, very excited and humbled and blessed to be here and to be interviewing um, our mentor, our advisor, our lovely professor, Dr. Dora Ahmad. Um, I will be discussing her book, again, The Penguin Book of Migration Literature. Before we do that, though, I'm going to give a brief introduction um, about Dr. Ahmad, and then she will be reading an excerpt from her book. And then Sonia and I are going to have a discussion and ask Dr. Ahmad a few questions. Of course, afterwards, we'll open the space for any and all of your questions. So please be thinking of them. Some of you already have them. We're excited um, for Dr. Ahmad to answer them. Okay. Um, so, Dr. Ahmad is a professor of English at St. John's University. She's been teaching here since 2004, having received her PhD from Columbia University. She teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in 20th and 21st century post-colonial and world Anglophone literature, post-colonial theory, world literature, pedagogy, U.S. literature, vernacular literature, and utopian fiction. She's the author of Landscapes of Hope, Anti-Colonial Utopianism in America, editor of Rotten English, a literary anthology, and co-author with Chandel Nero of Vernaculars in the Classroom, Paradoxes, Pedagogy, Possibilities. Born in Chicago, Dr. Ahmad has lived in Amsterdam, Lahore, and San Francisco. She now lives in Brooklyn with her family, which consists of her husband, her two daughters, and three pets, very important, named Sushi, Sashimi, and Persimmons, as well as a lizard named Alfonso, which is a type of mango. I asked, I asked for specific details. Um, when asked about her favorite meal, Dr. Ahmad said she loves everything and anything her husband Oren makes, and he's right here, so yay. Um, and now I will ask our lovely professor to read an excerpt from her book, once again, The Penguin Book of Migration Literature. Hi, everybody. Um, 
first of all, there's seats up in the front, so if you're planning to stay, or even if you're not planning to stay, please come get more to the front. There's at least there's at least uh, four or five seats, um, and you can take these poof things. What are they? I don't know. Somebody should use them for something. Um, we also have cookies in the back and books for sale. Um, I want to start by thanking Sonia and Layla for agreeing to be my interviewers, which I was so happy about. Um, Dr. Travis and the English department for the support of this event, which Dr. Mintz brought to campus a while, maybe 10 years ago, and it's been a really nice way to get together and celebrate faculty publications, uh, both the product and also the process, so all the sweat and stress that goes into the, the final thing. Um, and I want to also thank the staff of the Writing Center for opening up this beautiful space for us to talk about that same process and product. Um, so I'll start off reading from the beginning. I always tell people like I, I didn't actually write most of this. All I had to do was pick out some pieces and put them together um, and ask somebody else to get permission to use them because that part's really annoying and complicated. Um, and then write an introduction. So I'll be reading from the very beginning of the intro. Um, not too long because I'd rather spend more time in Q&A. Um, but I'll just read for a little while, and if it seems boring, then I'll stop. But really, let's get some more people sitting in front and eating some cookies. Um, okay, so introduction to the Penguin Book of Migration Literature. Every year, millions of people move to a new country. From war refugees to corporate expats, migrants constantly reshape their places of origin and arrival. It's rare for a single day to pass without news coverage of the many migrations, voluntary and involuntary, documented and undocumented, that characterize contemporary life. Over the past several decades, sci sociologists, demographers, political scientists, and economists have given their academic views on the causes and effects of migration. For an equally valid and possibly more nuanced perspective, we can turn to literary sources, poems, short stories, novels, memoirs, and graphic novels. For migrants and non-migrants alike, literature renders migrant lives comprehensible and familiar. While one can find origin-specific anthologies, for, for example, African, Caribbean, or South Asian diasporas, and destination-specific ones, for example, Canadian, British, or US immigrant literature, this is the first collection to offer a global comparative scope. My hope is that the Penguin Book of Migration Literature will convey the intricacy of worldwide migration patterns, the diversity of mig migration experiences, and the common threads among those varied experiences. It's the very complexity of the migrant experience that leads me to consider this an anthology of migrant literature rather than immigrant literature. Definitions can be dry, but they lend clarity, <coughs> and many of the terms around migration can be loaded and confusing. Migration denotes any long-term movement. Emigration is the act of leaving a place, and immigration refers to arrival. So all migrants may be classified as emigrants or immigrants, depending on perspective. But more realistically, all migrants feel themselves to be both emigrants and immigrants at once. Yet, even the most welcoming and sympathetic commentators in destination countries tend to speak of immigrant literature rather than the more holistic migrant literature. An anthology or university course titled Immigrant Literature elides migrants' prior histories, suggesting lives that begin anew in a host country. I wanted to include that sometimes neglected history, which is why I begin this anthology not with arrivals but with departures, and sometimes the decision not to depart at all. Similarly, we end not with assimilation, but with the possibility of returns. For homelands always linger, even if only on an emotional level. Besides the qualities of being global and multi-directional, an essential element to note about migration is that it exists in a continuum of voluntary to involuntary. Forced migrations, enslavement, transport, in other words, deportation to an overseas prison, trafficking, Political or religious persecution, exile, expatriation, form the world that we know. While slavery might not traditionally be considered within the literature of migration, I find it critical to consider the full history of people going from place to place. Therefore, I've included writers like Olada Equiano and Phyllis Wheatley, whose insights help us understand the massive forced migration known as the Atlantic slave trade. Okay, I'll stop there. <coughs> 
Uh, Dr. Maud, you mentioned uh, in the introduction that the uh, anthology derived um, from a course you were teaching. Can you talk a little bit about how the uh, course subject matter propelled you to develop this anthology? Sure, thanks for that question. So before, I, I taught a class in 2014 called Comparative Migration Literature, but I'll actually go back even before that to when I was first hired here. So in 2004, I was the first faculty member who was focusing on literature in English that wasn't from the US or England. Um, so I was teaching post-colonial literature, global vernacular literature, um, and some of what became the Comparative Migration Literature class. And one thing I noticed was that when we were reading texts about migrants to other countries, not the US, whether it was Canada, Australia, England, um, my students found those experiences very familiar to them. So I'm thinking specifically of Zadie Smith's White Teeth, um, which details the, the coming of age of three kids growing up in the Northwest area of London. And my students would read about these uh, two Anglo-Bengali, one Anglo-Jamaican kid, and it felt like Queens for them. It felt very similar to their own experiences if they were first generation here. So I thought, why does the US have to have a monopoly on immigrant literature? Why, how come when we think about immigrant literature here in the US, we're thinking about US immigrant literature? So at that point, I put together a comparative migration literature class. And I should say that um, both with our former department chair, Dr. Sakari, and with our current chair, Dr. Travis, we have the freedom in the English department to design classes that, that we're really interested in, that represent our current research interests and the whatever intellectual directions we want to go in. Um, so there was no question or pushback about developing a class that, that didn't exist, that I didn't see on the course rosters of any other university. Um, so 2014, I designed the class Comparative Migration Literature, and at that time, it felt like kind of a fun, affirming, positive place to talk about the comparison among immigrant experiences in different countries. Um, it was like a, a sort of a nice, positive experience for, for all of us. And then I taught the class a second time in 2017, and suddenly things felt really different. It felt like we had to fight to defend the idea that migrants are human beings, that migrants deserve to be wherever they are. The, the political tenor felt very different the second time around. And I realized in retrospect, I was a little bit naive because in 2014 when I taught the class, there were family separations at the border. There were long detentions. Um, so I think there were things that I wasn't really seeing at that time, but the those came to the fore more, the rhetoric changed. Um, so it was really these two different iterations of the class that pushed me to propose the anthology as a book. So sometime post 2016, I think it was actually before I taught the class the second time around, I happened to have the chance to meet the editor at Penguin Classics, um, who is kind of an amazing visionary who's really changing the idea of what a classic is. Um, she's a woman of color, she's a canonical and non-canonical and anti-canonical thinker, and I felt like that would be a great place to put this collection together and to, to turn the class into something that a bigger audience could read. Great, yes, thank you. Um, I don't think I need the microphone. Um, but so you've, Dr. Mad, you've talked about how the experience of teaching the classes were different pre-election and after election. So this, as everyone knows, is a very tense, you t I do need, okay, I do need the microphone. So uh, I'll repeat, just Dr. Ahmad mentioned how different it was to teach the um, migration class pre and after the election. So I was wondering how this anthology was affected by the election and if you felt that you needed to add more voices that were maybe attacked more because of the election, because of the policies that were being enforced, did you, um, did, has, did it help you be even more thoughtful in your selection and in the introduction and in introducing each of the authors? Yeah, absolutely, thank you so much. Um, 
So migration is one of the oldest topics that you could possibly think of, but absolutely it took on a much more urgent um, quality for me, and I think the motivation, the overall motivation was the same, but the specific impetus was different probably every six weeks, maybe every month. Like I had to be very careful to incorporate the latest attacks on migrant humanity and migrant lives, um, but also remain true to the overall theme. So it kind of felt like working with a moving target, and I'm thinking about different phases where the book was happening. So I was first proposing it, um, then I was finalizing the selections, then I was writing the introduction, and then I was lucky enough to have Edwige Danticat, Haitian American, wonderful uh, fiction and nonfiction writer, write the foreword. So she, there was also a phase where I was reading what she had written and she was responding to different impetus as well. And then there was when the book came out and thinking about where to situate it in the world. So at each point there was some other kind of crazy, can you believe what this insane administration has said and done sort of phase. Um, so I actually remember, Leila, you were very helpful when I was first putting together what I wanted the book to look like in a book proposal with a proposed table of contents. Um, Leila had actually brought to my attention this tweet um, by a poet actually Kaveh who's in Kaveh Akbar, an Iraqi American yeah. poet, Iranian yeah. American poet. Um, at that, that this was the beginning of the Trump administration's uh, quote unquote Muslim ban. So we had this slightly shifting list of seven countries, eight countries, um, and Kaveh Akbar put together a list of poems representing all of the, the banned countries. So that was Yemen, Sudan, um, Iran, Iraq. It was, it was a slightly shifting list. Um, so I had the idea to make sure and include every single one of those countries in this collection in order to say these are places with poetry, with people, with stories. Um, so that was kind of one like political moment that was wrapped up in the text. Um, then when I was writing the introduction and when Edwige Danticat was writing the foreword, we had these quote unquote caravans at the border. Um, so that's something that she was responding to. After the book was already in press, I think like right around when it was coming out, we had the supposed president of our country um, saying that four congresswomen should go back where they came from. So this was like an ever-evolving story, and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't being reactive, but still incorporating. I mean, who knows what it's going to be next week, right? Um, so there was always something. Um, it's always it's it's going to continue to keep us guessing. But I think the responsive rather than reactive part of the book is there are all these diverse experiences. The world that we know has been shaped by migration, as I said in the introduction, both involuntary and voluntary. We're here to stay. Um, that's kind of the bottom line. Um, Dr. Ma, you. Um, you were intentional in including uh, migrant texts by indigenous and ethnic writers. How does the anthology speak to issues of diversity, representation, and inclusion, particularly in literary studies? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I did want to make the whole thing, um, th this could have been like 10,000 pages, right? <laughs> this could have never ended, and there's probably, I could put together a digital version that that never ends. Um, but I also wanted to um, make it manageable and make it representative. So I would say the first thing I wanted to do was make sure that migrations around the world were represented, that it wasn't dominated by US migrant literature, because I am. I'm sitting here. I am from the US. These are the texts that I probably know the best. Um, and I felt like there are a lot of U.S. immigrant literature anthologies already, so I wanted to make sure we had stuff from Canada, from the Gulf, from Australia, um, from other languages, from Germany, from France. Um, so having a global scope was the first part. Um, I also recognized that the migration experience differs very much according to various identity categories. So if you're a female or male, um, your gender identity, your sexuality, the age that you are when you migrate, your race, your religion, 
Um, all these different factors are going to, yeah, there are, there are absolutely are common elements, but there are so many different ways that the migration experience is going to be determined by your individual affiliations, your individual temperament. So I did want to make sure that there were like roughly half and half female identified and male identified authors. I wanted to make sure there were authors of minority sexual orientations. Um, I wanted to make sure and represent that spectrum of voluntary and involuntary migration. So there are people who go because it's a choice. Um, there are people who think about migrating and decide not to. There are people who don't have the luxury of deciding or not deciding. Um, and therefore, the, the tones and the genres of the pieces differ a lot as well. There are ones that are more kind of lighthearted. There are ones that are elegiac. Um, I had help from a lot of you, from you, Sonia, um, from Layla, from Tabitha. I got fantastic suggestions from so many people. Um, I felt like there was a lot that ended up getting left out, so I actually don't have anything about Eastern European migration to the U.S. That's kind of crazy, like that's the East Coast as we know it. Um, I don't have anything about people fleeing the Holocaust specifically, there's one that's kind of a decade later. Um, I don't have anything about the Armenian Genocide, I don't have anything about the partition of, of India into India and Pakistan and then Bangladesh. Like, there's massive oversights, but my hope is that the whole thing tells a story of commonality and diversity, that no two people have the same migration experience, but that any two migrants who start having a conversation with each other are going to find that they have some experiences in common. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a, a hard and complicated thing to um, to try and think about, and it left me with a lot of feelings of, oh no, I also should have, I should have put in this and that. I had a period where I just, I couldn't walk into a bookstore. Like if I went into a bookstore, I'd have five more texts that I wanted to add in, and then I'd call my permissions consultant, and I'd call my editor, and they'd be like, can you just stop? <laughs> so, and your, the first category that you mentioned about indigenous texts, um, the people who are living in the same countries that their ancestors lived in are have been massively affected by migration as well. So it was actually a poem that you called my attention to, Ellis Island by Joseph Bruchak, um, that I felt would, added a really important perspective that yes, I may be an indigenous American, or I may be an indigenous Canadian, or I may be an indigenous Australian, but my story has been affected by um, the invasion of people from outside or um, the arrival of people from outside as well. Should we be expecting book number two? Uh, Anthology <laughs> number two for the missing <laughs> voices? That's not part of a question, but if you can add. Well, what, what, I, what I did do actually, because it's such a massive topic, so I have a website, migrationliterature.com, um, where uh, Sonia, Layla, Tabitha, and a whole bunch of other people have me put together a list that's at the end called Suggestions for Further Reading and Viewing, um, which also has websites and films, but it's changing. There's new stuff like literally every week in multiple genres. Um, so in the website, people can add on their own suggestions and then I'll put them all in as well. We already had 20 pages here. I probably could have doubled that. So no part two, but just like ongoing, ongoing journey. Thank you. So we've talked about the book from the inside, the texts, and I was wondering if we can literally look at what is outside, like what the cover of this book, and I was wondering for those who can see it, if you're able to decipher the picture, if it has anything written on it, or are you able to see what's going on here? Before I ask Dr. Ahmad about how does one pick a cover and a great cover in that all of your other books that I've mentioned have amazing covers because being students of Dr. Ahmad, we notice she always does the meta analysis and she doesn't just look at a text. <sighs> so how, do anyone, does anyone have an answer of what is written? Can you not? Okay, then be surprised. Dr. Ahmad, the question is then, how does one um, find a cover? How does one, yeah, decide on a cover for, especially an anthology. So I actually didn't have anything to do with it, but I can talk about the process <laughs> anyway, and we'll probably hear more about this when Professor Brownstein is interviewed about his book. 
Um, it's kind of a back and forth between the author and the publisher. So the publisher has their ideas. One thing that's important for them is if you squish it down, does it still look good? Mm -hmm. So it has to look good on a thumbnail, it has to look good on somebody's phone. Um, so the, I'll, I'll tell you the, like the positives and the negatives. Um, the positives, the Penguin Classics editor, Elda Rotor, who I described as an amazing visionary, she was an English major in college, that's why the English major is awesome. She was also a visual art minor, and she's very attuned to, like, her books are beautiful. She has a whole bunch of series. Um, she has a series of African-American dystopian writers. She has a new series of... Um, kind of founding documents of American democracy. They all have that great thing where the covers line up. Like she's thinking very aesthetically. And she's also thinking about representation. So it's really important to her to support young, up and coming, current visual artists. So she had a bunch of artists in mind who were all immigrant artists. And her top choice was a Vietnamese American uh, painter and um, pen, and, pen and ink artist named Maddie Nguyen. And she just really had a vision of his work on the cover. Um, so he drew a couple of mock-ups. Um, the part, I, I, I love his work. Um, I wasn't sure about the word home. I thought it could be a little bit confusing because it's not in the book title. But they liked it. I think it's kind of cool. Um, so that was kind of not, not my decision, but a decision that I was pretty okay with. Um, there were two versions going around. They both had little, actually no, there were three. This is tiny people kind of pulling their belongings up from a shore. And I think his visual referent was um, the Mediterranean migrations of the past five years mm -hmm. or so. Um, he also had an image that was with people at an airport with bags. And I, I felt like I, I really liked the shore imagery because to me it recalled more centuries of migrations. It recalled the Atlantic slave trade. It recalled indentureship in a kind of a broader way. Um, but there was a version that had boats at the bottom and I, I kind of liked the one with the boats even more. Um, there was a different version that the colors were really like awful. So I was like, no, but I, I kind of like was a little nitpicky. So at some point they were like, we're done, we're done, we're done running things by you. Like this is it. This is what we decided on. Um, so I think Professor Brownstein would probably echo. It's a back and forth. Um, one of my favorite book covers was actually with my most academic book, Landscapes of Hope. I think the publisher didn't care as much because they weren't going to sell as many copies, and they knew that it wasn't going to be like super popular. So that one I got to choose even more, and I got to use an artist who's here at St. John's, um, Thaddea Sabrisa in the art department. She has a massive, like maybe six feet by four feet, beautiful drawing called Remnants of a Failed Utopia, and I felt like it fit in really well with what I was doing. Um, so that was a cool moment for me. But this, this was more really about the vision that the Penguin Classics editor had. Um, uh, Dr. Mai, talk a little more in depth about your decision to include the uh, listing of uh, the recommended list of uh, other migrant texts and resources. Thanks. So I guess I wanted to make the point that this is not a definitive collection. This isn't like the writings on migration. This is just a little bit. This is the ones that I happen to like really a lot and that worked well in my class. So I tried to think about genre representation and geographic and all these different identity categories and um, chronologic going over time. But there's so much else and what you like, what you gravitate to, what really speaks to you is going to depend on your own experience and what you like as a reader. Um, so I didn't want to make it seem like this is the end. This is really only the beginning. Um, there are a bunch of books that are published as Penguin Classics, so I had those marked off because the, the publishing company asked me to, um, but they tend to be a little more traditional, so those are kind of things I could have put in and chose not to put in. The things that were already in a lot of anthologies, like um, William Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation, um, the City on a Hill speech, those were things that I kind of felt like we have a lot of access to them anyway. Um, but if that's somebody's interest, like I've had people come up to me and say, like, what, what about the Puritan writings? Like, yeah, those are important too. You can read those. 
So, so that's kind of what that list is for, is if there's a particular direction that, that somebody wants to go. Um, I wanted, one, one important part for me was to include the migration routes, so I have these arrows in the back, um, what specific migration route those texts represent. Um, so that's hopefully, if somebody likes these readings, then there's so many different directions they could go. Great, thank you. So Sonia and I have a lot more questions, but we'd like to open up the discussion for any of you guys, students, professors, the husbands, anyone <laughs> would like to ask any questions uh, for Dr. Ahmad. I'll pass the mic. Any questions? We do have backup questions just in case, but we don't want to use them. We want you guys to ask questions. Questions? We also have cookies, so eat them. Questions, yes. Yeah. It says, ho me. <laughs> yeah, so that was the artist's idea, was to encode this word. And it is, it's one of the fuzzy words that recurs throughout the collection. Like, what is home? What is home to you if you're a migrant? Um, what are some of the different definitions of home? I wouldn't say every single piece deals with it, but really almost all of them deal with that shifting idea of home. Um, I call it one thing and then maybe I go back there and it doesn't feel the same way. So I like that it's a little fuzzy, I like that it's a little ambiguous, and um, we could decide that it's pronounced ho me if we want. That's Leanne's contribution. Like a, like a, the word me is definitely in there. Right, right. Like, yeah, so a lot of this is about community, it's about getting support from other people. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions, please? Yes. Mike and everything. Okay, so I was thinking about the Migration Literature website. Do you envision in the future it being an open access domain for migration literature? I don't know. <laughs> if somebody else can do the web design better than I can, <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, right now, it, like it doesn't, I, I guess I would have to approve it because the topic of migration produces a lot of trolling and like heinous um, backlash <coughs> thinking and behavior so I guess I would be wary to have comments just absolutely pop up because I think there could be like nasty xenophobic racist stuff showing up there I'm just I, I, I know that the first rule of the internet is don't read the comments <laughs> but um, sometimes I'm pleasantly surprised by comments for example in the New York Times Sometimes it seems like there's an article that nobody reads unless they're pretty interested in it already. Like there was a great profile of Solange Knowles and the comments were all like, I love her, she's everything. Like, great. Um, but if it comes to migration, that's, that's when things get so nasty. Um, so I would be a little wary of that, but I would love to just be able to like hit approve. Um, right now, actually, I went in and I do, I have a like, give me your suggestions for reading, and I realized there was one that had been sitting there for three weeks and I hadn't seen it, and it was actually my mom. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only one that's there so far, so there, there's gotta be a better platform. But <laughs> it's like, it's a free, I don't even remember if it's WordPress or Weebly, it's like whatever free site was working for me, and half the time I'm calling tech support, and, and they're like, oh God, it's you again. So yeah, if there were a better way to do it, then great, and if someone else wants to take over the design, that's even better, like maybe some other. <laughs> this is a simple question, but how is Penguin marketing the book? Is it marketed on a massive scale internationally, or is it mostly, you know? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> They, they do have an academic marketing team, so they asked me to think about what types of classes people might use the book for, which I was really happy to be able to brainstorm and think about. For example, here um, we have our, it used to be called Discover the World, but it's being more, accurate, more accurately renamed as Discover Western Europe. Um, it's a multi-country, one semester global exchange program and there's a migration theme so I think some of those faculty might use this as a text um, I've had interest from people in theology sociology um, I think there are more and more migration studies courses that are interdisciplinary um, 
internationally, I don't really know what's going on exactly. I'll teach you that now. Great. Yes. It's going to Palestine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you want to convince them to ask questions, Sonia? Oh, we have. Oh, yes. Yeah. See? Yeah. Okay. Your name. Hi. Um, I just want to ask, what inspired you to spread these migrant stories from other countries besides America? Mm -hmm. Thanks. So I guess I feel like there's a lot that we take advantage, uh, sorry, that we take for granted here that might or might not even be true, but there are ways that we tell the story of immigration in the US. So it tends to be told as a unidirectional story. Somebody comes from somewhere and then they come here and then their kids become American. So we have the melting pot ideology. Um, it tends to be somewhat, I think, oversimplified um, and somewhat uh, maybe overly optimistic. And I think putting migration in a global forum allows us to maybe get at more of the truth of the US immigrant narrative and then also think of it comparatively. So I didn't really have, I still don't have the background in the comparative law and politics but something like, for example, the idea of birthright citizenship. I, I didn't know until I started putting the collection together that that's so specific to the US. So in Germany, somebody could be a third generation, um, someone whose parents and grandparents grew up in Germany. Um, but if they're of Turkish origin, they're not gonna be a Jewish, uh, sorry, a German citizen, and they're not gonna be considered German. Um, so there's not birthright citizenship, and that's something that's still up for debate here that that is still being threatened to be taken away here so i think thinking comparatively is just always useful because it both helps us understand some of the similarities and differences but then also unseat maybe what what we thought of as our own truths in the first place um and as i had mentioned as as someone who was teaching literature from around the world it just seemed like an obvious way to do it for me because here in the US, I think we, we think we have a monopoly on immigration, but numbers wise, actually, our percentages are pretty low um, in terms of taking in new refugees, um, in terms of new immigrants coming here, um, compared to places like the Gulf or Australia or even Canada. Um, so I think it's just a way of, of making the story of migration a little bit more complex and a little bit more based on reality. Hi. Um, I was wondering how you went about selecting what forms of literature to have, because I know there's a handful of poems, there's even a graphic text, and there's a lot of short fiction. So what was that selection process like? Thanks. Um, so I think that has to do with my experience as a teacher. And for those of you who have taught 1100C um, literature in a global context, which is a lot of folks here, um, or other English classes, we know that different students are gonna respond to different genres um, and different modes and formats. And you could have somebody who's just absolutely so bored by poetry and in love with fiction, um, or where they maybe haven't run into graphic novels before, but the first time they see a graphic novel, it just clicks and makes sense to them. Um, I, I have a hard time with poetry. I understand prose a lot more easily. Um, so I, I was just, I was thinking as a teacher, and I was basing the, the collection on the readings that we did in my class. I think that when a set of literature is more topic-based or thematic, we tend to gravitate towards prose, towards fiction and nonfiction. But the poems in here are just so beautiful, and so, um, they, t they tell a different piece. Um, they bring a different tone and a different voice. So it was. It kind of goes back to Sonia's question about um, diversity of experience, diversity of expression, um, and even within the genres, it was important to me to include. For example, there are some poems that are very structured, like Claude McKay's *Tropics in New York*. There, there are free verse selections, like Warson Shire's *Home*. Um, in the fiction, there are ones that are sort of light and um, more humorous. Sam Selvin's um, Come Back to Grenada, which actually Dr. Autar introduced me to in the first place a, a bunch of years ago. 
Um, there are ones that are just absolutely heartbreaking. Um, Dante Cow's Children of the Sea is something that comes to mind. Um, so I think you, you don't really get the whole picture unless you see multiple genres, multiple kind of emotional registers. So it was another way of getting at the multiple truths of migration. Does anyone have any comments that you would like to share? Yeah, it doesn't anyone? have to be a question. Vicki, yeah? Oh, okay. strategic choice or if it's sort of representative of the text that you were able to find? Thanks, Vicki. So just to give a little background on um, Vicki's question, the collection is divided into four sections, but it's a little imbalanced. So they are departures, arrivals, generations, and returns. And I'm just gonna back up a little bit from the question. I felt like going, going back to um, the person behind Justin's <laughs> question, um, why, why include texts from around the world? Why try to complicate the story of immigration? I think another sort of cliche of US immigrant literature is that the story doesn't start until people get here. So I felt like it was important to start a step or two before that with people's lives in their home countries, how they go about making the decision to emigrate. So that was the, the origin section was everybody comes from somewhere. Everyone has a story of how they decided to move or how they were stolen from wherever they live or how they were forced out of whatever, wherever they live um, or perhaps how they thought about leaving and chose not to leave. Um, the arrival section really centers on, I think, sadly, the idea of disappointment. We were promised all of these things. This is the picture that we were given, and this is the reality, so that kind of gap. Um, then I have a section called Generations, which is about the children of immigrants and the experience that they have. Um, but that whole thing, that, that kind of umbrella, departures, arrivals, generations, that's a little bit linear. That's a little bit sort of developmentalist, a little bit unidirectional. It's the way that I structured my class, and I think it's a little bit dishonest, because that's not actually how complicated the story of migration is. There's always a pull, I have to get back, I have to go bring people stuff, um, I wish I could go back, but I can't, I don't want to go back, but <laughs> my family wants me to, whatever it is. Like, it, it's not, it's a conversation that's always going on. Um, so, for the anthology specifically, I added a section called Returns. And that section, there just wasn't as much to choose from, and the one piece that I found, I felt like just absolutely encapsulated that phenomenon so well that I almost felt like I, I didn't need more. I think it's something that, that writers are starting to write about more, so there wasn't as much to choose from, but the, the phrase I always go back to is from Juno Diaz's The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wow, where he says, Every summer, the diaspora engine slaps into reverse. So this is not, it's not a one way, whether you're actually going somewhere or just thinking about it or longing for it or putting it off or waiting on a line to get your visa or knowing that you can't because you won't be able to get back in, that's always there. But that short story, there's only one short story in the return section, it's called A Conversation. And the funny thing is, I actually just found it on the copy desk in the back of St. John Hall B40. I thought maybe it was from your class. <laughs> it's by an Egyptian-American writer called, uh, named Pauline Caldas. It's called A Conversation. And it's a conversation between a retirement age husband and wife who are trying to decide whether to go back to Egypt. So there's two speakers. It goes back and forth. I think maybe one of them is in italics so that as the reader you can see who's talking. One of them loves it here and doesn't see any reason to go back, and the other one is saying, well, we always plan to. This is what we want. We've been building this house. This is where our, our home is. So again, going to that fuzzy word, that fun, fuzzy, sometimes indistinguishable word, home. Um, that story just crystallized so much for me, and there wasn't that much else. So I kind of felt like 
that would sort of cover it and help to disrupt the, the unidirectional push of the other three sections. Not my story. Okay. So I don't know I where win. that came. Like, thank you, St. John Hall. The <laughs> There's magic out there. <laughs> Um, I was just going to ask, in your efforts at trying to both unsettle categories and then to, but also to be representative in the arc as you're describing there, did you find yourself coming up against writers or texts that were um, describing multiple migrations, even within a family, and the difficulty of categorizing along those lines? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm thinking about something like Shani Mutu's Out on Main Street, which I may have run into from you as well. Um, so she describes, um, this is a Indo-Trinidadian Canadian queer writer who, I think the story is set in Vancouver, but she's um, based in Toronto. And she describes all of the different categories that she fits into and also fails to fit into. So it's a, this really complex, fascinating story about the way that the narrator um, defines herself against everyone she sees. So she's in a, a sweet shop in the Indian neighborhood of Vancouver, and she feels like she doesn't fit in because the owners of the sweet shop are real Indians, and she's a watered-down Indian. Um, so that's one of the double diasporas. Um, I think a lot of a lot of the stories of African or South Asian origin represent double diasporas as well. For example, Sam Selvin's characters in London um, ancestrally have gone through multiple migrations or at least two migrations. Um, within families, I don't think. Well, yeah, actually, there there should be. That's that's obviously such a big piece of people's experience is one sibling being here and one sibling being somewhere else. Um, there's a story heading somewhere by Jamila Ibrahim, who's an Ethiopian Canadian writer, which I got from Sonia, and the story is in two pieces. One character who's kind of living a comfortable middle class existence in Canada as. Um, half of a sort of somewhat arranged, um, he's a, an Ethiopian character who's married to a white Canadian woman who's kind of like taking care of his, his papers and his immigration status. Um, but his ex-girlfriend, who he's still kind of in love with, has been working as a domestic worker in Syria and is trying to escape the conflict there. So he's obsessively Googling, trying to keep track of what's going on. Um, so those two migrations play off against each other in that short story. And I think probably a lot of them, if I went into them with that lens, we would find yeah, different, different roots, different pressures, um, different migration experiences, even within the same text. I'm curious about your, uh, did, was there anything about the way that your book has been received, either some of the reviewers or others that were either that surprised you, either things that they saw that maybe which you've seen in advance, or things they might have gotten right or wrong? Thank you. I think I had that, that thing that we all do where like you're handing in your essay that you stayed up all night writing, and you're like, this is terrible. <laughs> like You can see all the flaws in your own work. Um, so there were components, there were things that I felt didn't work perfectly that so far none of the reviewers <laughs> have mentioned, like why isn't this in here, or um, there's too much stuff that appeared in the New Yorker magazine. <laughs> um, I think I I've been really happy with the response, more so even than I expected. Um, so I think when I was finishing it up, you just like, you see all the problems with your own work, and you have to take that leap of faith and hand it in. We didn't really talk about process that much, but writing is very stressful and lonely and confusing. Um, so I think when I, when I did hit send on it, there were imperfections that I was afraid would would take over the reception of it, but I think people have been very kind and charitable, and I think what I'm happy with is the range of stories that are in here and the way that the different people can see their own experience mirrored. 
across a range of experiences. One final question okay. for you. Um, how do you envision the Penguin Anthology reaching audiences outside of the Academy? I guess hopefully based on word of mouth. I mean, I, I tried to keep it light. Like my dream is that I get on the subway and somebody's reading this book. I really <laughs> hope that that'll happen. Um, I don't, I'm kind of crap at marketing, <laughs> publicity. So I don't know, it's up to you all. Like buy it for somebody for the holidays. <laughs> buy it for Lana in the back of the room. All right, I guess if there's no more questions, we can wrap up and I want to thank all of you. to personally thank you, uh, Dora, for allowing Leila and I to interview you. And it's refreshing to see all of you students and faculty here to celebrate Dr. Maud's anthology. I would also <coughs> encourage you to read the, the review uh, that was posted in New York Times recently. It was a star review for the anthology. So I encourage you to review that. Also to review the suggested list of uh, migrant texts after you read the anthology <laughs> to review the uh, recommended list of other migrant texts and resources, films, uh, audio recordings, and uh, thank you for coming everyone. Thank you. Thank you.